practitioner perspectives on sentencing both nationally and here in New York State. Uh, but before we delve into these important discussions, we are pleased to be joined by President of John Jay College, uh, President Carol Nathan, who will deliver opening remarks. Thank you. Um, well, let's thank Crystal again. She's doing a fabulous job, and she was with me. And I'm just apologizing for anybody who's sit, sitting on that side of the screen. Uh, you can't see me. I'm sorry. I'm short. Um, so good afternoon, and welcome to John Jay. Am I close enough to the mic? Yep. Okay, because I know Crystal had me. So good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this important convening and conversation. Um, as you know, John Jay is the place where we can have all these wonderful conversations, bringing people together who aren't always in the same space. But what I know about this room, just from being here this short amount of time, is you all already know each other and already work together. <laughs> and that's what's going to make sure that we get some really good work done in this convening. So yes, give yourselves a round of applause. So, um, so we're grateful, I guess. There are people online? Yes, there are people online. And where's the camera? Because if it's over that. there, they don't see me. That's all right. Okay, that's all right. They can hear. Um, so we have several esteemed guests joining us today for this discussion. And I would like to acknowledge a few of them um, first. So we have New York State Chief Judge Rowan Wilson. We are so grateful for his leadership on all of these issues and his leadership of the court. Um, the Honorable Julia Salazar. Mm -hmm. We have had a wonderful conversation as well. And I don't know if the Honorable Latrice Walker is here yet. Okay, yeah. she'll be here later. They will all be sharing their time and insights on sentencing reform in their roles as public officials. Um, they will be joined by several experts and impacted individuals who are also experts who are studying the devastating impact of sentencing laws and championing ways to reform them. At John Jay College of Criminal Justice, we seek to educate and prepare our students and the next generation of leaders like you all in this room to be scholars, advocates, practitioners, and visionaries of tomorrow prepared to build a more just society. And we've got some John Jay. Can the John Jay grab in the room or raise your hand? Because I know there's several of you here. Thank you. So, you know that what we do here is important. This event was organized, as Crystal mentioned, in partnership with the John Jay's Data Collaborative for Justice, and I finally got the new name down. Uh, those of you who are old enough to know know why what I really meant. Um, yeah, not, of you, not enough of you know that. They used to be called something else. And the Center for Community Alternatives, thank you all for being co-hosts with us for this important conversation. So the Data Collaborative for Justice studies the criminal legal system broadly reporting on every stage of the legal process to better inform policymakers and the public of its outcomes. The uh, Center for Community Alternative offers innovative justice solutions by supporting justice-involved individuals through direct community-based services, advocacy, and public policy development, which seeks to end mass incarceration and mass criminalization. So the purpose of today's conversation is not only to highlight some of the initiatives that our speakers, speakers have spearheaded to address sentencing going forward and to take it a step further and to consider what it means to, by, uh, by accountability, justice, fairness, and um, equity and how we deliver on those promises. So I have a lot here that they asked me to say, but I'd rather you all get to the work. But I, I want to tell you about something and something about the power of our students. Yesterday, I forgot my clock. So yesterday I went to the reading of uh, excerpts from our students who published in the John Jay Finest. It's a competitive process where they, they write and, and it's um, their the selections are picked and the best are put in John Jay's Finest. And so there's a young um, woman, one of our students who is a sophomore, and her piece was entitled Life Relocated Perspectives on Racism and the Japanese Heritage Internment. And you're probably thinking, what does that have to do with sentencing? Um, but what it has to do with sentencing is justice. And this is how she ended her conversation with us yesterday. Keep in mind that this is a sophomore student at John Jay. 
And she talked about her paper and she said, the question she said, said she asked herself is, what have I learned from this paper? Um, and she said, I'm gonna quote her and work from this class. She said, from this paper, I've learned that we don't learn about the mistakes of our government to tear it down, but to build it up, to give those wrong recognition and apology and a voice. It gives the new generation a chance to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. I learned that the law never promised not to make mistakes, but it did promise to strive for justice. So we study the past to change the future, and we recognize those who, who've wronged so that we can do right by the generations to come. That's a sophomore here at John Jay. And I just thought, I know that they gave me prepared remarks, but I thought I'd rather set the tone for this conversation with the statement from a sophomore here at John Jay who will be sitting in your seats one day. And her name is Kimberly Smith. And she's K-Y-M Kimberly Smith. And so what you all are gonna do today is, is going to be reflected for generations and our students coming behind us will be talking about what you all have accomplished today because of this conversation. And notice I said, they're gonna be talking about what you've accomplished because I know that through the, the relationships you all have in this room, the, the, the commitment you all have to each other to stay in dialogue and to not just talk, but to really make change and to work through systems change that you're gonna make sure that this young woman's words were correct. And that 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 the law may make mistakes, but we use it to figure out how we get better so that we get to justice. So thank you all for your commitment to get into justice on the sentencing piece and for thinking about what it is we really want to accomplish in our system and the why. So thank you for your time this afternoon and giving me an opportunity to welcome you all. Good luck. Hello. That's a lot said. Um, Carol, if it makes you better, feel better, I've just lowered the microphone to where you had it. Um, <laughs> my name is Katie Schaefer. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Organizing at Center for Community Alternatives, CCA. And I have the honor of welcoming up the first panel. Um, so I will say your names and your titles um, as you come up. Um, the people who are coming up have very long, illustrious bios that are all on the website. I will not be reading them aloud for you. So I'm going to welcome up at the Chief Judge of New York State, Rowan Wilson. New York State Senator Julia Salazar. Professor Steve Seidman, who runs Clinic and Peace, a member leader at CA. And Patrick Stevens, a youth leadership fellow at, at CCA. And then finally, I will welcome up your moderator, Ben Bass. Um, whose publication I continue to admit. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to those watching the live stream. Um, thank you to our panelists. What a great panel. And um, I know you have two uh, great ones in store here. So we're going to get right to our conversation. Uh, my name is Ben Max. I'm the executive editor and program director at uh, New York Law School Center for New York City Law. And um, I was talking with some folks at New York Law School uh, the other day, and they mentioned that of any school sending students to New York Law School, John Jay has had the most graduates, uh, at least in recent years, um, but maybe for a long time, sending students to New York Law School. So uh, a point of, of great relationship and pride there. Um, so very pleased to be here to talk about this topic and the and the many questions and reforms on the table um, with this with this great panel. Uh, we're going to talk for about forty minutes or so, and then open up the last fifteen minutes to questions. So I'll offer you the opportunity to come up to one of the mics, and we'll be taking questions from Zoom um, as well in our last uh, fifteen minutes of our time here. 
panelists. I'll be asking a series of questions, sometimes directed individually to you. But please, if you have something to say, responding to another panelist, you know, if I if I can step out of the way, that's great. You you talk, you know, talk to talk with each other, and let's have a good uh, flowing conversation here. We'll touch on several pieces of legislation that seek to reform sentencing in New York and discuss both the problem as you see it from your perspectives, what the data say, and the potential solutions. As the event description here says, we're going to talk about strategies, including the repeal of mandatory minimums, second look policies allowing judges to reconsider excessive sentences, and earn time programs that prioritize in prison transformation rather than incarcerating people for as long as possible. So if you each take a moment, and we will get to solutions and the legislation very soon, but if you each just take a moment and talk about from where you sit and your experiences and your role and your perspective, how you think about the problem we're here to talk about, that would be great. And Chief Judge, uh, I, I know that just talking about the, the issue here could be something that each of you have a lot of perspective on and could be 15 minutes straight of each of you discussing this, but as briefly as you can from where you sit, how do you think about the problem we're here to talk about today? I can do it very briefly, I think. Thank you. I'm not sure my microphone is on or off. Let's see if if it's up, it's, it's off. It's on? If it's up, it's off. If it's up, it's on. No, it's up and it's not on. And it's down and it's not on. No. So I can just talk more loudly if that works, although I may not show up the time. You're being rescued. Okay. I don't, is that, that's not on. Oh, it's on. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So very briefly, uh, the United States incarcerates more people per capita than just about any other nation in the world. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is it is racially discriminatory. And problem number three is the sentences are far out of proportion to, to you know, the, the criminal activity generally. And particularly a problem is that the fact that the maximum sentence can be quite long forces everybody to plea bargaining because the risk is too great. Succinctly, that's it. Wow, well done. Senator Salazar. Thank you. Um, that was quite succ succinct. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Okay, excellent. Hi, um, I'm State Senator Julia Salazar. I uh, chair the Crime Victims, Crime and Correction Committee in the State Senate. Um, and in that capacity, I spend um, a substantial amount of time actually visiting um, correctional facilities, uh, New York's 44 state prisons across the state, um, meeting with um, incarcerated individuals. I, I see um, the Correctional Association <laughs> of New York here in, in the audience um, often and visiting facilities with, with you all. Um, and in meeting individuals who are incarcerated, find that there are many, many people just as the, the data reflects um, anecdotally and, and personally meeting individuals who have been incarcerated for a very long time for, um, you know, have, were given sentences that today virtually any of us would consider to be deeply unjust, but there is not a mechanism to um, right the, that wrong. Um, and so there are thousands of people um, incarcerated in our state who um, really, uh, it, it would be in the interest of public safety for them to be home and, and back in their communities and our communities. Um, New York State has the third largest population of people serving um, a sentence of life imprisonment in the country. That doesn't even speak to how many people are serving egregiously long sentences short of, of um, a life sentence. So this is a serious problem and excited to um, talk to you about some policy solutions and responses to it. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, so glad to be here. This is work, right? Um, you know, I, I, I think about this second, really focused on second looks. I just, this is a line. I, I, I stole this from something. I don't know who to attribute it to, but this is how I approach this. A sentence once imposed does not remain just, necessary, inappropriate in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're stuck right here. So I ask you to think about, this is the way I view this, just, and maybe this will be helpful for some people to think about the rest of the afternoon this way. I run a clemency clinic at CUNY Law School. So we work with people who are serving massive sentences, trying to get a second look in the form of clemency from the governor, who has the absolute power to set people free. 
And this is the prototype of the situation we deal with, which is why a second look is so crisp. So stay with me. This is a, when I say it's a prototype, this is something that happens frequently. And I know there are a lot of people in this room who've lived this. So just bear with me a second. A woman comes to our office and says, when my son was 20 years old, he was living a dangerous lifestyle. He was a little lost, hanging around with the wrong folks, got involved with a robbery. Things went horrifically, terribly wrong, and two people were killed. And he got 50 years to life. It's now 30 years later. He's 50 years old, a mature, grown, adult male who accepts and acknowledges responsibility, has done everything humanly possible to atone. What can you do for him? What can we do to extricate him? Because he's still got 20 years to go before he sees the parole board. He'll be 70 should he live that long. And as I think we're going to end up discussing without a second look bill, in New York State, supposedly blue, progressive New York State, the door is pretty much closed. So that's how I approach second book. Thank you. Yes, we'll get to that very soon. Mm -hmm. Sharice. My name is Sharice, Sh Sh and um, my brother's name is Sean Peace. He's currently serving a 110-year sentence in Green Haven Correctional Facility. Um, and just hearing you speak on your your mission really just hit home because that is very much my brother's case. Young person went the wrong way and just hadn't had an opportunity to demonstrate his uh, reformative efforts to society. Um, but in terms of the problem, mass incarceration, it does not work. It's not a solution, um, nor is it a deterrent to crime. It uh, impacts communities um, from the smallest level from the individual to the family, the community, to those incarcerated, to those working in the correctional facilities, and it has no place in a progressive society. So um, I am here just to lend my voice, not just to my brother's cause, but to many and all who have been impacted by the system and, and just to help us move towards change and make some progress. Thank you. Patrick. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Stevens. I'm a leadership fellow at the Center for Community Alternatives. And, uh, I, you know, I, I was just thinking about what's the quickest way to sort of like sum up how I feel uh, about the system from my perspective. And it's very difficult, but I, I'm going to do my best. I think fundamentally, outside of the racial disparities, outside of all of the injustices that we see with the system in general, I think for me as someone who is only incarcerated, who did uh, 24 and a half years of a 25 life sentence and came home to, to do this work, um, one of the most troubling things is the way that the system itself imposes so much control over individuals that it does not really see, right? So the reason that you get the sentences that you have is because I don't really see the individual. The individual doesn't matter. Um, and in fact, what you're seeing is more of a caricature of the individual, a sort of stereotype that says certain people are deserving of longer sentences and right. others are not. Beyond that, the, the legal system that we have gets in the way of things that would be better, right? So in the instance where someone harms someone else, the two things that you really want to see out of a justice, a legal system, are accountability, right, and healing. And those things are totally separate from the system that we have. And so for me, um, having this system sort of gets in the way of more progressive and more hopeful ways uh, for everyone. It's, 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 it's as if you have a poisonous system that destroys almost everyone that it touches. Mm -hmm. As much as you try to heal, as much as you try to recuperate from the trauma, I'm not just talking about incarcerated people. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about corrections officials who work in these systems who are harmed by it. I'm talking about judges who impose some of these sentences, who, which they, they come to regret um, and think differently about. And so for me, it's just having a system that is just so built on these narratives that are false, that essentialize people, that reinforce hierarchy, that are not beneficial and, and helpful to us. So mm -hmm. here. Thank you. And I appreciate everyone's succinct answers, and I don't mean to rush you at all, but we do want to get to two proposals and solutions. And before we do that specifically, if you could each say something about how you think of the goals here, 
when we talk about mass incarceration and sentencing reform, how should people in this room and everywhere across New York and, and, the, and the country and the globe think about what the goals of sentencing reform should be and the goals of rethinking mass incarceration? How do you identify those goals Assuming in many cases we are talking about instances where there has been some harm, as, as several of you got it, what should be the goals of reform in this area of criminal justice? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I would say it's, it's a balancing. It's a balancing of, of public safety. It's a balancing of treating people humanely, mm -hmm. uh, and a balancing of, of uh, you know recognizing that everybody is an individual, whether you're a victim or you're you know somebody who's accused. Uh, they're individuals. Microphone, am I just not close enough to it? Is that better? It's okay. Um, it, it's a balancing of those things. And, and you know, keeping in mind that we're now, I think, incarcerating, let's see, it's back. So, uh, okay. we're, we're now incarcerating um, a lot more people than we need to, and that's costly. It's costly to them, it's costly to taxpayers, and it's, it's also in the name. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that a goal should be reevaluating what actually constitutes and contributes to public safety and challenging this idea that um, sentencing someone to a longer period of time in prison is somehow going to translate to making our communities safer. Um, I think actually there's a lot of evidence that 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 is not true. Um, and so it should be our goal to challenge that idea, um, and then in in practice um, implement reforms that that actually challenge that right by um, re reevaluating excessive sentences, um, but working with individuals who have been um, involved in the cr criminal legal system or who are considered at risk of being involved in the legal system um, to improve their lives and um, their their communities so that um, we can actually improve public safety in a more holistic way. Um, I think the way I approach this, then it might be more limited. But for me, the goal of sentencing reform, what we're talking about here, this has to be about rectification. It has to be about redressing the crisis of mass incarceration, that dealing with the fact that we have this crisis right here in New York State, we have massive sentences that have been doled out for the last 20, 30, 40 years in New York, primarily to people of color, and most of the reforms that you hear but for the Second Look Act are all prospective. Let's get rid of three strikes, very important. Let's get rid of certain drug effects. All that is great, but what are we doing about the living environment? Mm -hmm the people who are excuse me, presently incarcerated. So for me, the most important thing in this discussion is about how do we rectify it. And I just wanted to um, piggyback off of the excerpt from Kimberly Smith's um, paper that our lovely president shared with us, um, just about our system not always um, doing the right thing um, in historical context. This nation has not always been on the right side of justice, humanity, or morality. And as we know, there have been policies put in place, laws that have been passed to help and undo some of that harm that's been done. And so um, in terms of mass incarceration, we need that same perspective. We need to have that same progressive movement towards truly analyzing the system, um, picking it apart from the roots, and just really putting something in place that actually is effective. Um, in terms of the individual, um, I would say that a goal is just to demonstrate the redemptive qualities of people. If we have a system that has confidence in itself, then there will be no need for these excessive sentences or mass incarceration um, just on its own. Um, so for the people to have confidence in the system. The system has to have confidence in itself. Um, and just one more point before I pass the mic to good friend Patrick here. Um, where I come from, in my neighborhood, we have an unwritten code called no snitching. 
And um, that is reinforced by the current penal code. And it's not that we don't know that there are people who are in need of rehabilitation or corrective measures. What it is is that we know if we pick up that phone and make that call, we are turning our loved ones, our neighbors, people in our community over to the hands of the system that will not be fair and will not be just. So for there to be change on every level, it has to start with legislation. So, um, I think we have, I, I take a longer view um, towards sentencing reform in that I see it as a first step towards better practices, more restorative practices that keep um, people out of prison, number one, but also foster community, right? Like how do, how do we get people uh, responsible for people who have harmed other people and the people who they have harmed in, in more conversation with each other? And even though these bills don't specifically address those, but when you think about a second look and the ways in which incarcerated individuals have to demonstrate transformation, what better way to do that than to have that individual who is deeply apologetic about the harm that they have committed and how they engage with people that they've harmed, right, to, to foster uh, more community. So for me, this is a, a, a first step towards a more um, healthy uh, and better system. Thank you. We won't always go in the same order, but let's come back to um, Chief Judge Wilson uh, here. And we don't need to always go go down the line the same way. Good. But um, uh, <laughs> Chief Judge, I think in part given um, our mic challenge, maybe you could repeat your such, a, it was such a succinct answer to the first question. Maybe you could repeat it and then add on the answer to this question, which is um, you have, as Chief Judge, been overseeing the continued evolution of a task force that is um, reevaluating many criminal justice policies and making recommendations. So if you could, again, say a little bit about how you view the problems we're here to discuss today and how that task force uh, plays into addressing. So, so to some degree, this is sponsored by the data collective. Uh, it's, you know, the first, my first answer is really data-based. That is, if you look at the great per capita of incarceration, how it is around the world, we're way up near the top, and you wouldn't want to be with the other couple of countries that are up at our rate. That they're not the countries you think of favorably. Yeah. Um, so that's point one. We're, we're incarcerating more people than anybody in the world. Yeah. Point two is, when you look at who is incarcerated, it is people of color. Disproportionately. Same thing, just look at data. It's, it's not controversial. It's, it's not disputable. Um, and then the third point is the sentences are just far too long. And I think everybody's been saying that. And that has pernicious effects, not just on the people who are there, but it's it's how they wind up getting there. If, if you look at how few cases, there's been such a decline in jury trials over time. And it's because people can't take the risk. You know, I'll plead guilty to 15 years because 25 to life could mean I never get out. Uh, so it's it's those three points. And so it, there's a there's a task force that we have called the Justice Task Force that I've really tried to revitalize. And I was very happy that the first report sort of under my administration, and I should say it's composed of all kinds of people. It's composed of criminal defense lawyers, public defenders, district attorneys, professors, uh, judges. And its first report under me uh, in January uh, of uh, this year is about second book. And it has a whole lot of recommendations about second book. And it, it describes the process for getting them. Some of the uh, whole group sort of unanimously or near, 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 unanimously got to. Some uh, were you know, more debated, but there was still a majority for them. And they're, you know, I'm not saying those are exactly how that legislation ought to be uh, enacted, but there's a lot of work there. And the task force was very much in favor of something being done. And many of them, I think, you know, that, for example, some of the uh, recommendations are there shouldn't be any limit on the number of times somebody applies, uh, that that uh, you should have a right to appeal. I think that was uniformly or universally by the task force to agree on. And you can find this on the course website. You just search for Justice Task Force New York. It'll pop up and you can see the reports. And the first one on the top is the second one. I think it's, it's really informative. And keep that mic for one sec. <laughs> um, there's there's 15 recommendations in the report. Their uh, you know their initial reading is is pretty tight and succinct and accessible. So I do encourage people. We're not going to read through all of them, but I do encourage folks to um, 
to read that report and the recommendations, and that ties into your bill, Senator Salazar, which we'll come to on in a moment. But I wanted so to I ask you. I take one interruption. Yeah. Oh. I want you all to meet Kimberly Smith. <laughs> <laughs> have the opportunity to know that that what she wrote really resonated with this group that is going to make a difference. So thank yeah. you, Thank you. At the, at the root of a lot of the reforms that we're talking about today, eliminating mandatory minimums, Second Look Act, Earn Time Act, uh, some of the other work that happens in this space is actually um, the notion of returning more discretion to judges. Will you say a little bit about your perspective on that uh, question, that, that fundamental issue to the judicial system? Well, that's, I think, a mixed bag. So I expect people to produce good results for state people. But you know, one of the things I think about um, having a, a diverse state the way we do and having judges who are elected, largely speaking, is that, and also, you know, judges need to be independent. I'm a firm believer in that. But the combination of those things means that if you took the, set, the same second look file and you gave it to several different judges, what you would get as a result would be varied. So it's going to benefit some people. Other places, you know, it, it's going to go, um, you know, it's not going to make a difference for admire. There are things that the court system can do about that. We can try to educate judges. We can try to make things a little bit more uniform without telling judges how to decide. Um, but sometimes simply by exposing to, and this isn't just true for judges, you know, when you see what your peers are doing and you're an outlier, you start to think, why am I an outlier? And so there are ways, I think, it won't happen immediately. With second look, there are ways that we can somewhat more standardize results. So I'm optimistic, but I'm not, I don't think it's a, a you know a miracle. And lastly, this time around with the microphone. Um, one of the fundamental questions in second look is whether a case should be appealed to the judge who uh, gave the sentence. W what's your philosophy on that? If, if it's possible, so, obviously, sure. there's many instances right. where it wouldn't be. But So the task force's recommendation is that it does go back to that same judge. I, you know, Part, I think, of the task force's view that way was that it would cause a lot of strife within the court system if it were going to different judges. Um, I, I can see both sides of it. Um, I, I think maybe you want to see how it works going back to the same judge, and if it's not working, then rethink that. The <laughs> nice thing is that everybody seems to agree there ought to be an appeal, and our appellate division departments have the ability to ensure justice to reduce any sentence. And so that, I think, mitigates to some degree the fear that the judge who sentenced you to 50 years is just going to say, no, I meant 50 years, and this one meant, and, you know, sorry. But there's still a way around that. Thank you. If we could go to Sharice before we come to Senator Salazar and her bill. If you talk a little bit about this specific uh, legislation, about uh, second look policies and your perspective on them, your experience advocating for changes in this, in this, the way this is done. Sure. So the second look act would directly impact my brother and many others in this situation. Uh, my brother's sentence was the result of mandatory minimums um, and just that draconian sentence stacking um, uh, you know, model that's pretty much in the norm um, for, for the state. So what second look would mean for my brother is that he gets a second chance and that he's able to demonstrate that he has reformed himself as his sister. I can say, and I mean, I'm just gonna be very transparent. When my brother was in the midst of his deepest struggle, I sat back and I did not know what to do. And I called the police on my brother. I identified him, not because I wanted to see my brother in jail, but because I did not want to see him in the grave. And um, now that my brother is 15 years into his sentence, he tells me, thank you, sis, because I would not be the man that I am today if you did not have the courage to make that call. When I made that call, 110 years never, ever passed my mind. And I promise that had I, well, I can't say, because you know, you, you never know what you would do in a situation until you're in that situation. 
But I can guarantee you that there was no other choice. I could not comfort my mother through the loss of her youngest child and only son. And I knew that my brother was lost because I myself was lost. I was impacted by my environment and my community in the way that a young woman of color can typically be impacted by those factors. And my brother was impacted by the same factors in the way that a young male of color in a particular environment is typically impacted. I became a mother at a young age. I was a chronic runaway. Um, you know, if not for motherhood, God knows if I would have been able to really stop myself in my tracks. So motherhood was that catalyst for me. And prison is a catalyst for my brother. Now, I'm not saying this because, oh, you know, the system is, uh, you know, fault free or anything like that. What I'm saying is anyone who is incarcerated and they are making conscious efforts to reform themselves, that is an autonomous decision. There's nothing that is really in place to encourage them to really make the change so they can demonstrate to society, hey, you know, I'm here, you know, I, I, I paid my dues and I'm ready to come out and show that I can contribute to society in a meaningful way. And that's really um, what I know from conversations with my brother. I know that that is his objective. Um, he's involved with a program called RTA. Rehabilitation through the arts is currently a, um, well, there was a, a documentary put out um, about a gentleman who was in the same prison and he went through RTA and was able to rehabilitate himself and, you know, make a, a meaningful contribution to society even after, um, you know, having been uh, convicted of crimes. And so that just goes to show that people can change. And so the second look at just taking it, you know, back full circle would give them people just an opportunity to show that they do have redemptive qualities and that people can change. But for people to be able to demonstrate that, you need the system to change too. Mm -hmm. And the second look at it would, would definitely offer that opportunity. Thank you. Senator Salazar, you're the um Senator Salivar is the lead sponsor in the New York State Senate of the Second Look Act. Say a little bit more about your legislation, if you would. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on how the bill and the recommendations from the task force are aligned, not aligned, how you're thinking about any updates you may make to the legislation and maybe how you might get it passed. Absolutely. Um, so the um, task force report that Chief Judge Wilson referenced, um, I actually have it printed out right here, and I find it very informative, um, which is why I um, also reference it often when talking about the need for Second Look legislation. Um, the Second Look Act um, that I am the sponsor of would allow for individuals who have been sentenced, convicted and, and sentenced, currently incarcerated, serving that sentence um, for a crime, it would allow them to apply to have to, to the court to have their sentence reconsidered. Um, currently in New York state law for context, um, a person, there is a mechanism for a, an individual to apply to have their sentence reconsidered. However, um, it is only uh, currently on the basis of that sentence being unlawful um, or unconstitutional, right? So it there is currently no mechanism in New York state law for someone to um, appeal to the court based on their sentence being um, otherwise unjust, not in the interest of justice, um, excessively long, et cetera, um, and to give judges the discretion to modify that sentence. So um, in short, that is what this legislation would do. Um, as was already discussed, um, a, a difference between the recommendations of the task force and um, this bill as written is that um, this, the, this bill would have um, a different judge than the judge who originally sentenced the individual applying um, for their sentence to be reconsidered, um, rather than the original judge um, taking the, the case up again, uh, it would be assigned to a different judge. And actually, as Chief Judge Wilson um, spoke about, um, this is not, you know, this component of the legislation is not something where it's like, 
uh, judges and prosecutors think it should be this, and advocates think this. Um, it is a little bit, you know, there there are pros and cons, I would say, to um, having the judge who originally sentenced someone um, versus a, a new judge, and some of that does have to do with um, perhaps a, a judge being deferential to um, a, a judge who previously sentenced someone, um, and other and other things to consider. Um, so it's a little bit complex, but but um, you know, the motivation here is that if, you know, you, you want the individual who is applying for their sentence to be reconsidered to um, sort of the, the, go before a judge who won't necessarily have have a bias against them. Um, you know, I think we, that's always the, the ideal scenario, but we really want to prevent that from happening um, and from uh, an inju in, injustice being, um, you know, perpetuated. Um, additionally, this legislation would create a rebuttable presumption in favor of a sentence reduction if the person who applies is 55 years of age or older, um, or if when they were sentenced they were under the age of 25. Um, this has to do with, you know, uh, so-called youthful offenders um, and understanding that um, an individual is still learning and growing and developing um, when they're under the age of 25. And so it is not necessarily in the interest of justice for someone who committed even a very serious crime when they were a very young person to be um, serving an excessively long prison sentence. Um, and then, of course, uh, we would want a rebuttal presumption in favor of a sentence reduction for older individuals, people over the age of 55. Um, one, we know that uh, people tend to age faster in a certain way, right? Time works technically the same way, but but um, uh, the prison environment has a negative impact on a person's health and their aging. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's so that's that's one thing to consider. And then additionally, we there is abundant evidence um, to demonstrate that uh, people sort of age out of um, the behaviors that uh, would lead to them um, committing a crime or being convicted of a crime in, in the first place. And um, they are exceedingly less likely to recidivize or commit a crime again in their life um, when they're at an older age. Um, so there's really minimal risk to the public safety. Um, so I think that's, yeah. that's basically and, what it does. And just quickly on the sort of status of the legislation as our sitting legislator here, lots of progressive and democratic priorities passed over these last five years that Democrats have held both houses of the state legislature and the governor's office. These reforms we're talking about here today, not just your bill, but other bills on the table here haven't moved. What's the status of, of thinking about the chances of passage of some of this? Yeah, um, have, yeah, I, I, so to, well, I think it, it, it was already mentioned that what is somewhat unique about the, sec, the Second Look Act in terms of sentencing reform is that it would help people who are already currently incarcerated. Um, equally important, of course, for us to eliminate mandatory minimums, for example, and do sentencing reform in other ways, but um, that can make it a, a heavier lift, right? These are, um, we're talking about individuals who are already, um, have been convicted of crimes, um, typically serious crimes, given the length of, of the sentence. Um, and we have a lot of, I think, public education to do um, to in, inform the public about um, the harmful impact of this um, and to change hearts and minds about um, what public safety actually means. Um, so, you know, to actually answer your question, um, this bill is still in committee right now. Um, we have seen progress um, local in localities around the state, um, efforts to introduce um, resolutions in support of the Second Look Act. Um, and. I and, and others advocating for this bill in the state legislature are talking to district attorneys, um, others, you know, stakeholders, essentially, um, about moving this legislation so that we can actually pass it and, and make it law. Uh, but it's very much so in progress. Thank you. Let's come to Patrick um, to talk a little bit about a different uh, piece of legislation here, the Earn Time Act, and a little bit about 
um, what that would do, uh, what it could mean in terms of potentially taking a real bite at the challenge of uh, these sentences that we're talking about reforming here. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. So I think, so early time at, um, the view of that is that we bring back early time, good time um, for people who are incarcerated. And the idea would be you could earn time or be a sentence for participating in programming, positive programming, um, supporting your community in a particular way that would allow you to earn on um, that time off. I think that the, the beauty of, of the consummation of these bills in general is the idea that uh, people are dynamic, right? That they change, they evolve as they know more, they do better. And um, you know, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm very happy to be here with, with Professor Zayman because uh, Professor Zayman worked on clemency bills for individuals that I was incarcerated with who were doing amazing work while they were on the inside, developing programs that helped individuals while they were incarcerated to get educated in terms of their health, in terms of their senses, and, and a lot of the positive work that they were doing on the inside. Having the Earn Time Act we incentivize a lot more people to get involved in some of this positive programming. And we're talking about not just college programs, uh, I'm talking about prisoners and AIDS counseling and education. I'm talking about getting involved in the Osborne Association, uh, some of the clerk work and supporting uh, incarcerated parents connect with their children who they've been estranged from. So these are things that are not only good for the general society, but for those incarcerated, the, the culture inside of the prison can be transformed by something as simple as knowing that I have an opportunity to earn time off my sentence, doing things that are positive, which quite frankly, uh, if you're an incarcerated person, sometimes the incentive is to stick to yourself, right? Let me just go to school, let me just get involved in this program and not really think about how I'm impacting the culture inside of the prison, right? Because there's a risk. There. The more I put myself out there, the more likely I am to get into trouble or to get into a fight that I might not be responsible for, but at the end of the day, I can create the brunt of that. Having something like Earn Time Act says, you know what, that might be a risk that I might be willing to take, right? In a situation, I can help other people and help myself. And despite the fact that it may seem self-serving in a way, it has been my experience that people who begin with a self-serving motivation over time, you can't keep that up, right? As you, as you get involved in this program, you become a different type of person and um, it becomes part of who you are. And I think that will translate well for individuals who are returning citizens um, as much as the transformative culture inside the prison itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's come. We talked a little bit about um, the the fight to reform mandatory minimums and and your work and how it, it coincides and how uh, reform of elimination of mandatory minimums would or wouldn't impact some of the work that you do. Sure, sure, but but comment on anything else you're you're. Thank I you. see that. I see. That. I know. I know that look. I know that look. Uh, I'm going to get to mandatory minimums. I just I just want to mention one thing. Um, just about about clemency as sort of the canary in the coal mine when we start thinking about second looks. So here's sort of the good news about clemency. When, and I just have to reference Judy Clark over there, who's the motivation behind this. So there's your, yeah. When, when the efforts began, or at least our efforts began to look at clemency in 2015, people said, sort of like what we're talking about here, it's a waste of time. Nobody gets clemency, in particular for a violent crime, in particular for a homicide. And in fact, that was true, because from 2011 to 2015, the first four years of the Cuomo administration, not a single person had their sentence commuted. So there's the good news. Since then, 55 people have come home by clemency, most of whom were convicted of homicide. So to me, that's the good news. The door is opening. Maybe there's a recognition. Maybe there's a willingness to reconsider these massive sentences, even for people who were convicted of homicide. But here's the two cautionary tales that everybody who cares about second look, all of this that I hope we'll kind of figure out what we can do about. Over time, when you are trying to get clemency for someone who's serving a death by incarceration sentence, what you run into is whether it's the governor's office, the district attorney who you're trying to get support from, they say, well, you know, but a life was taken. And I'm talking about homicides. I think if we want to have this conversation, we have to talk about violent crime. 
Because okay. those are the people doing the longest sentences. Those are the people who most need second looks. And we can't turn our back on it. And to me, I've had people say in the course of this work, well, I think if you took a life, you forfeited the right to ever walk free. Mm -hmm. And, it's, you know, it just, and I have to say, I, I've never figured out the right way to answer it other than saying I've been blessed. I've never lost a loved one to violence. But I just have to hope that we collectively can hold out a place for redemption. For everyone's inherent capacity to change and to grow and transform and not close the door. But the violence piece, it, it's a problem. And I wanted to hear, I said there were two concerns. And I think it's important to say this. When you apply for clemency, and this is going to be the same thing with the Second World Act, if it's a violent crime, the governor's office always asks, do you have the support of the district attorney? Do you have the support of the trial judge? And I'm going to tell, I'm just, over 75 clemency applications. You want to know how many times we got support? I don't have to tell you, right? So I worry about second look. We are so fixated on the legislature that we have to say, we can win the battle and lose the war. Get the bill passed and prosecutors will oppose it and the judges won't resentence. And then what have we got? So to me, it's we double our efforts. We focus on the legislature to get the bill passed. We focus on elected district attorneys to say, start agreeing with clemency, start getting ready for second looks. And then we focus on the judiciary to say, do the right thing as well. So that's, I, I just feel like it was important to put that out there so we don't just focus on the bills. Sure. Um, Thank you. I've already gone on a while. I'll let oh, other people great. talk about mandatory minimums. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody can. Actually, I'll, let's, oh, do you want it? No. Oh, fine. Yeah, I just wanted to come to the chief judge on that, actually. Um, is, is this something that the task force is that looking is at? What task force yeah. is looking at right now, the next project is mandatory minimum. So I have to say, it, uh, you know, and I've seen the first text they have, and they're exactly what you expect, but the you know, mandatory minimums have a, a disparate impact on people of color. And they're going to work out a report on that, that, you know, make it a better part of the year. But but I guess I'd want to try a few things. Please, yes. One is that it's kind of funny that DOCS is called what it's called. Because that's the Department of the Corrections, which has been doing a whole lot of including supervision, but it's sort of do, but it's mostly a way to pull people back in. That's right. So part of what we need to do is when we, when we have this stuff in the book, is to make sure that the people who then come out have been given the supports, not you know, before they come out. But that was a, there was a man at Oldsville. And they released him without a birth certificate that had his name on it. So we couldn't get anything. And I, you know, I got him a pro bono lawyer, but even with that lawyer, it took him several months before we could get a correct birth certificate. If you're going to leave, you know, release somebody who's been in prison 20 something years, you make sure they have the things they need, not just a birth certificate, but they had some training. Other people I spoke to said the training we get here is a pair of small gasoline engines. He does that anymore. Mm -hmm. We train people in, in writing software and code, you know, in, in uh, debugging things and cybersecurity and, you know, things that are parts of the third society. You know, I think, you know, so the second look, yes, you know, it's very important, but we need to also to make sure that the people we're releasing, whether it's on second look or otherwise, have the supports they need to get into the community, have the supports they need once they're in the community. Second thing is, there's another piece of legislation that I think is very important. And I think that these two sort of work in tandem, one perspective and one retrospectively. The other is what's called the treatment, not jails um, uh, legislation. And if we could pass both some form of the second look and some form of the treatment, not jails legislation in the next legislative session, I think we will have to make a giant step forward. Because we would stop incarcerating people who have potentially treatable mental health or substance abuse, often co-occurring disorders, mm. and treat them instead of jailing them in the first place. And then we can also address through second look people who've been incarcerated for a long time. So the last thing I want to tell you about is a case I descended in, I don't know, five or six years ago. It was called People of the Alvarez, a man named Omar Alvarez. When he was 18 years old, he was involved in dealing heroin. He shot a 14-year-old who was on a street corner, uninvolved otherwise. And uh, he was sentenced to 66 and two thirds years in prison. So when he's almost 85 years old, he can be released. Now, what's happened to him in the interim? He got an education. He adopted his girlfriend's child. He then got married to her. He then had a child with her. So he's got two children on the outside and his wife. The prison system misdiagnosed his cancer. So he's now a paraplegic confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. His wife can support him outside. His kids want him outside. What are we doing? 
hey, what are we doing? I understand the point that he killed somebody. None of us can bring that person back. But I, and I have a 13 year old. I would hope that if somebody shot my 13 year old, which I would never happens, that I would have it, if, if I were at this point, and if it had been Mr. Albers, it had been my 13 year old, that I would say enough is enough. And I think that's, you know, that's the point that was made earlier, and I think we need to get to that point. Thank you. I'm going to invite um, a few people who might have questions to come up to the mics, and we'll move to uh, audience questions in a moment. Um, go ahead, yeah. If you're if you're ready, I'll, I'll get to you in just one second. Um, it was raised, it, the, you, Chief Judge. Your your final point there, I think, goes back to what Senator Salazar said about getting some of this legislation passed, needing to change hearts and minds. So I don't know if. Um, anyone on the panel wants to just say one thing about those efforts and about what it looks like to do the work or what's needed to do more of that changing of, of hearts and minds to get more support around uh, this type of legislation, because it does seem like in a state that is passing a lot of progressive priorities and, and so forth, that some of these criminal justice measures continue to be sort of off, uh, off on the side. We say a little bit about what that looks like and, and what it looks like not just necessarily in parts of Manhattan or Brooklyn, but other places in, you know, in New York City and state. Yeah, so I think, first of all, a, a lot of this work um, has to focus around the narratives that we tell each other about people who are incarcerated and the crimes that they commit, specifically when it comes to, um, to violent crimes. And for me, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a huge uh, restorative justice fan. Like, I, I really believe that that is the way that you get to a better society where you can have really real accountability and healing. It is one thing to sentence someone to 25 to life and punish them. Um, that is not the same thing as holding that person accountable. You can do a lot of time in prison and never really think about mm -hmm. the people that you've harmed and you know, just go through the motion. I, I, you know, I go to school, I do the right things, I get released, and I don't have to, to think about the people that, that I've harmed. So to the point about um, these violent crimes, the things that people don't realize is that the vast majority of those people are coming home anyway, right? And you have to ask yourself in what condition you want those um, people to return. I remember when um, I was sentenced um, and during the allocution, the, the mother of the young man that I had killed um, sort of addressed the court and she said something to the effect that I don't know what Patrick was thinking at the time he killed my son, but it is my hope that during the time that he's away, that he gets his life together, that he becomes a different person. Right? And you have to understand, this is the mother of a young man who was murdered in front of her house. And even in that moment, she's extending to me some capacity to say that I know that you're a human being, I know that you're capable of change, I know that you are more than what you did um, to my son. And I think for us, in terms of thinking about reform, we have to think about ways that we allow the people that we have harmed to have access, right? That's what real accountability is about, is to be able to say to someone that I harmed, look, I'm deeply sorry for what I did to you and your family and to my community, I'm a different person, and I'm committed to being that different person um, to at least honor the memory of the people that I've harmed. They, again, the constellation of these bills is such that they allow people the opportunity to be those individuals that you want to see to be your neighbors, no matter what, um, what they are, what they are convicted of. So for me, again, it's always thinking of the long view in what our system can look like, instead of being what it is, which is which is traumatic for everyone, um, and very adverse to, to the healing that I think that we need. Thank you. Um. Question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this important panel. I, I um, what we're talking about is giving grace, right, to people, uh, because we know that people change over time. So I commend all of the work that you all are doing. Um, I'm the founder of the National Clean Water Collective, and one of the things that we've been working on is um, uh, looking at root causes to why things happen. Uh, we focus on providing relief to communities uh, that are going through a water crisis. And so in Flint, if you look at uh, many of the kids that were dealing with leaded water, they were dealing with mental health issues. Um, and it, if you know what lead is, it's a neurotoxin um, that causes uh, kids to commit um, 
later on, there's, there's reports that, that say it causes kids to commit violent crimes. Um, I had the unique pleasure of speaking with um, someone that just come out of uh, prison 10 months ago. It's interesting how we sort of connected, but um, one of the things that he said is when he was younger, he would eat the paint off of the wall when he was younger, and they started to um, diagnose him with mental health issues when he was young. This person is probably 40 something, 50 years old. He's been incarcerated for more than 10 years or so in and out of prison. Have we looked at the broader scope of why folks, especially black and brown people are being incarcerated? Um, like maybe the environmental inequities that are happening in their communities because we are forcefully um, based on um, systemic racism um, been um, uh, subjected to a lot of these issues. And that's why we go out and commit, I'm saying generally, because I've never committed a violent crime, thankfully. But um, have we looked at that? And are we looking to work on that, those those sort of issues? I think it's important that we sort of look at the root causes. And one other thing, if I could just plug oh, in. I, we got we to gotta get an answer, because I got to get to a few more people. We're hosting an event here that's actually talking about that on next Wednesday. And I wanted to share with the public. But Thank it's okay. You. Thank you very much. That's my question. Thank you. Anybody? Well, uh, I will say just from um, my experience working with advocacy is that um, that is one of the objectives is to give judges just the freedom to evaluate mitigated circumstances. Um, you know, things that c contribute to crime. Um, you know, in certain areas, why we have more black and brown people in prisons um, here in the United States um, than in any other country. Um, so I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, take the floor too much on that, but I do know that that is one of the initiatives is to just give judges the autonomy to just look at everything and not just be stuck to a standardized sentencing format. Do you want to let me know? Thank you. Next question, sir. Yes, good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to take the thank the panel um, with regard to their insights about sentencing reform and where we're currently at with that. Uh, I did 28 years in prison. Two of the gentlemen that's responsible for my release are sitting on this panel. I'm going to go to the when I was sentenced to 25 years of life, Penal Law 1.05 is the five primary reasons that an individual is sentenced to prison, right? Punishment, deterrence, incapacitation, retribution, and reform. There is no reform. I have been, along with practicing and other individuals, been in these dark premises and spaces for years. The work that was done we took and we did that ourselves. We broke ourselves into a million pieces and put ourselves back together piece by piece. Now we are contributing citizens and doing the hard work out here. The answer, like Steve said, we have to deal with violence. Daniel Surrey, in her book, Until We Reckon, there are four components to why people are subjecting other people to violence. One of them is they were subject to violence, right? Isolation, not having the economic way in order to sustain themselves, right? So when I listen to experts talk about reform, right? The problem that I have primarily with that is this. Much of the criminal justice reform movement is superficial and deceptive, and it's therefore dangerous. It is designed to quell calls for genuine change while preserving the architecture of mass human case. When we already know that that doesn't do anything to change behavior. So the nature is so with the problem because understanding why the punishment bureaucracy exists and who it benefits is vital to dismantling it. And one other thing, none of this is happening by mistake or inadvertence. It's by design that we subject to where we're currently at. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eric Davidson. I was just recently released on executive clemency after 
serving 14 years in my 16 life sentence. And just as I met you a couple of months ago at Sing Sing, when you came to, it was your student, Chloe Sarinsky, um, from years prior to that, but since you met doing my release. Um, I've been doing time since 1993, three state bids, all for burglary in the second degree. Collectively, I served 29 years in prison where I never even seen my victim and no violence actually happened. I'm all for um, treatment, not jail um, program that you was talking about earlier, absolutely. And had I was given the treatment prior or even an offer of it, I may not have ever served that kind of time. Um, during the course of my incarceration, I lost all of my family members. You know, they all passed on. I came out to nothing, not one single family member. Um, my transition has, has been difficult because, you know, the, just getting the birth certificate, the social security card, it was hell, the back and forth and, and the traveling expenses. I mean, I'm spending like $70 a week on just traveling. There's no support that people can get these metro cards to go to and from. Um, times have changed in between that. The, the tech was so difficult. I'm having anxiety, incredible, like going through my phone. But I'm learning every day. I mean, it's a growing process. Um, I'm so sorry. I want to try to get to a couple other people. Yeah. You have a quick question. So, uh, I'm all for, you know, there, there needs to be some kind of programs in place for guys like us that are coming out. It, and it's not just on clemency. It's just you're coming out, period, because the services essentially suck. Mm -hmm. You come out, a, and you're really struggling trying to get to all these areas to go. Some, something Chief Judge Wilson spoke about before. I don't know if anyone else um, has a thought on services upon re-entry or efforts around that, that work? Yeah, I, I, I sympathize with you with the, with the tech aspect. Like, just this morning, I was struggling with, like, hey, you setting a password. I was like, why do you need this complicated <laughs> <laughs> to do, you know, I, 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 I with that. Um, I think God has done a lot of good work in terms of transitional workshops to help guys with tech, how to do email, listen to the you know, a text and an email and stuff like that, and also um, supporting people. I think the, the other interesting thing, and, and it seems uh, counterintuitive, but a large part of my support coming home was from other formerly incarcerated people who had been doing well, who could be able to say, look, here's what you need to do, here's the help that you need, um, which is interesting because the law is such that it doesn't incentivize that. Like, you're not supposed to be in conversation with other formerly incarcerated people, particularly if they're on parole, but the reality is those are the people that are going to give you all uh, the best support in terms of reaction. We, we definitely need to rethink uh, what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, my name is Alexander Dockery, and I want to say thank you to all the guys on the panel because I think the work y'all doing is incredible. Um, the gentleman that just left, I too just ran a clear city um, in January. He came home. Um, that was arrested for and sentenced to 25 life for a burglary. But there's no people involved. Same as, same as him, same thing. Um, while incarcerated, um, I know Patrick Stevenson. Um, we both got our masters and together and our DA together and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm out here now and I'm having a hard time housing, employment. I'm finding it hard, right? So I'm wondering for guys like myself, what do you have in place to help me succeed? Right? I'm definitely not doing crime. That's beyond, you know, but I'm still trying to find a way to find my way in society, right? To 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 um, you know, to go forward, right? And I'm having a hard time. So I, I need assistance. So I mean, mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Alex. Yeah, Alex is is the star of our at BPI and New York Theological Seminary. Um, I think. So one of the things, so this is another initiative that we have at CCA, the Clean Slate initiative that was passed last year to sort of address some of those issues. How do we keep employers and housing people from discriminating against formerly incarcerated people who, who, would, who would be great employees, right? Um, so there is no real mechanism to provide that opportunity outside of, again, going back to the narrative work, how do we change people's minds about who is deserving of employment, who's deserving of housing, who's deserving of opportunity? 
And so that's something that we can all take part in. There's so many individuals here who are formerly incarcerated who are doing great work and who are great examples to what is, is possible um, post release as a returning citizen. So I, I think one definitely support Clean Slate and the work that we're doing on this one. Um, again, and all of these bills that we're talking about as a constellation are going to shift the narrative about who's deserving and, and who is not. Mm -hmm. I know, I know everybody, I'm so sorry, it's timed. I know everybody has valuable uh, questions and contributions. I wish we had hours more, forgive me. Um, but thank you to our, our panelists. Thank you all for being here. Um, and Crystal's gonna come up and transition this. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Um, I feel like the gentleman Patrick was talking about the passwords changing. You know, yes. We all, and, oh, okay. There's there's my presentation. So I'm going to be able to really just push this button. Um, so I am here to talk about what is happening nationally in sentencing reform, and and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, as you heard, the quite I was there were so many great questions and so such great dialogue in the, in the previous panel, but. Um, there was a very specific question to Senator Salazar about, so how is how are you going to get second law passed? And you heard her talk about uh, narrative change and the need to basically build a case amongst her fellow legislators, the leadership, the governor about this. And I have found, I, I have the previous stand in government working in the governor's office, so I, I have a sense of how they think. They want to know what are other states doing? Are we going to be sticking our necks out? Are we the first to do something? Um, what you know? What do our competitors do? And so I, the message is that even in this time when we have heard so much in the last few years about uh, sort of the, the return of the rise, the tough on crime narrative, and we've certainly seen that in New York, uh, where there seem to be many bills introduced to increase sentences, instead of decreased sentences. So we are we are in a period in New York and across the country where we're really having to fight in a defensive posture. But even in those times we are still changing laws to reduce sentences. And that is that is the message I definitely want people to take away that there there is progress and here's some of it. So uh, second look we've been hearing about that. There have been many bills that have been introduced. Question is which ones have actually passed. And uh, you'll all get this PowerPoint. There's no point in me reading it, but you know, DC did it. Maryland did it for for young people, for people who are um, convicted of crimes when they were young. And, what, and interestingly, Colorado had a, a version of it just last year, in which people who were sentenced under their three strikes laws um, for long sentences are now eligible to petition for resentencing at 10 years. Um, so we heard about earn time, the bill in New York that would allow people to earn time off their sentence for participation in programming and good behavior. Um, Mississippi, not the most progressive state. I heard the word progress a lot. Uh, not much how you describe Mississippi. Uh, just 2021, they changed their law significantly so that people convicted of violent offenses, and I agree, we really need to think about to bring that narrative back to people who are convicted of violent offenses, uh, they change the law. So they are now eligible for parole consideration at, when they hit 50% of their sentence or 20 years, whatever's less. And Virginia, uh, you know, sort of ratcheted down their the amount of time that people need to serve, their truth and sentencing laws, uh, significantly including people convicted of violent offenses. Okay, enhancements. What do we mean by that? Those are things that they tag onto sentences you have to serve longer and longer. And it sounds like um, Sharice's brother was, uh, that played into his very, very long sentence. Um, something we have here in New York is called the second felony offender law. You have to be your pitch. If it's your second felony, you end up with a mandatory minimum. And in California, they have something called the, colloquially called the nickel prior you would get five years added on to your sentence for your second serious felony. Well, that, uh, that got rid, they got rid of that in 2019. That's now discretionary. So a judge doesn't have to sentence you to that additional five years. Um, there was you know, uh, another enhancement having to do with it. Every time you had a previous, even a jail sentence, they could add it a year on to your sentence. They got rid of that. And more importantly, in 2021, they essentially said all these enhancements Judges shall dismiss them. Like they don't need to use them um, if if the furtherance of justice requires that they get rid of these enhancements. So that's sort of a catch-all. <laughs> and in Delaware, it's not just in crazy California. In Delaware, uh, they eliminated their sentencing enhancements based on prior drug convictions. Okay, mandatory minimums. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that. Last last panel was very movingly, uh, all, mostly about second chance, um, second look. Uh, but mandatory minimums is, is going to be really my focus. So where have we seen them change? California just got rid of them for, for drug offenses. D.C. got rid of all of them. Then they ran into the buzzsaw of national politics and Congress 
overturned their bills uh, to reform their criminal code. They're trying again. They've just launched a new campaign to eliminate mandatory minimums in D.C. And in Tennessee, again, not a progressive place, they removed mandatory minimums for drug offenses in school zones in 2020. So I um, just want to, I know I'm talking fast and trying to keep on time here, but you, you've sort of heard this dichotomy. We need second look for people who are in now because that's the only way that we're going to affect people who are serving very, very long sentences, unnecessarily long sentences. Um, and that's absolutely true. And I think Judge Wilson and others should have cautioned. We're not, we don't know how this is going to play out. Like, will judges actually use this? Will DAs, how will they come down? All of that is very important, how that will work. We always have to ask ourselves, why are people in there for so long to begin with? So we have to attack this on the back end and the front end. And so the, the push to eliminate mandatory minimums is that front end push and will affect people for years going forward if we're successful there. So that's why we really, I want to be focusing on mandatory minimums to take nothing away from second look. You just heard why that's so important. Uh, so why is it so important to return that reform and return minimums? Wow, it's one of those things where each one pops up. Um, so the first thing is what you've heard. It's about restoring consideration of an individual, not just their offense. Who is this person? What happened? What were the mitigating circumstances? Second, it's, you know, mandatory minimums are the floor. And if, if the floor is really high, that the building is going to be really high, right? So if you have high mandatory minimums, your whole sentencing structure is just it's just un unbelievably out of proportion. So we need to get rid of that floor in order to just bring everything down. And as you've heard, the, 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 there are big racial disparities in, in who is being charged with crimes that have mandatory minimum. It's about to hear that they're like, that how people are actually sentenced, they're gonna be sentenced according to what the law is. But when you're arrested for a mandatory minimum charge, you've got that hanging over them. So you're likely to plead plead guilty to something uh, uh, to make that case go away, which is okay. Which is actually my fourth part. But getting to the third part, um, you know, mandatory minimums is just one size fits all. It might not be what, it certainly might not be what the person arrested wants. It's not what the crime survivor wants much of the time. They might want a very different process and a very different response. So by getting rid of a mandatory minimum, a one-size-fits-all, you are creating options for everyone, including crime survivors. Um, and I have this great quote here from D.C., from a, the Network for Victim Recovery at D.C., which is a crime survivors group, that says essentially eliminating mandatory minimums brings back justice to our definition of it, not their definition of it. Okay, so the last part is I was asked to talk about, well, what, what about the critiques of sentencing reform? What, how do we talk about narrative to get people to actually pass bills? I think you heard all of that in the last panel. So I would just narrow it. I would just say it's really three things. You have to talk about accountability. Accountability matters. Everybody thinks so. The question is, how do you hold people accountable? And Patrick was incredibly eloquent on that. There's many ways to do that that are far that create far more healing and repair for the crime survivor than putting someone behind bars. Second is about safety. Absolutely. I mean, if you just talk to someone walking down the street and say, why do we, why do we have the criminal legal system? They're like, well, don't we want to be safe? It's synonymous. Sentencing and, and, and safety are synonymous in people's minds. Like, we just got to keep these people safe. So we really have to talk about what actually creates safety. And you heard that in the other panel. There's really good evidence that long sentences do nothing to create safety. We over-incarcerate. So we just need to get into that, not just throwing a bunch of numbers at people, talk about a combination of numbers and stories. And third is really, well, what else can we do? This is what we do. This is what we've always done. Like, what else are we supposed to do when we have people who've harmed people or there's troubling behavior? And the answer is there are a range of alternatives that have been proven, proven to reduce crime and facilitate healing. We don't use them much in this country, but they exist. They are being used, so let's talk about them and let's create alternatives. So a judge or a prosecutor says, you know what? We're not going to do that anymore because it doesn't work. It's not what crime survivors want. It doesn't build safety. We're going to do this instead. So we just need to bring that up. Those are your messages.
Great, Thank, thanks, Martha, and, and rapid fire. Uh, but, and uh, you know, just on the idea of kind of restorative programs, like from, from your perspective, like why is it so hard to make the case for restorative programs? Like it, it feels to me like it's been years that we've been talking about restorative programs. So it, 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 you know, you heard about um, on the last panel from Patrick, like, why is, why is it so hard? I mean, I think we're evolving. I, I mean, I was incredibly impressed at the, uh, at the sort of the, the skill and the depth and the, and the sheer humanity, which I've heard in that last panel. We have, well, I think we sort of talked amongst ourselves a bit. And so we're like, yeah, we're sort of justice. We know about that. I make it a point whenever I'm, in some place and I'm sitting next to somebody in a suit who looks like they probably don't think about criminal justice, to talk to them about criminal justice. And I say things like, um, do you want to, you know, you want to be safe? Yeah, I want to be safe. You know, like, um, so do you think that, that somebody who's like in a dispute with somebody else is like looking up the penal code before they uh, like get into that dispute? Therefore, you know, that long sentence is going to keep them from doing something? No, that makes no sense. You know, and then, so what do you, and then we start to talk about it, and the notion of restorative justice, that what somebody really wants is an apology, is a sense of how you can make amends, have their, have their hurt recognized, that that is what is transformative. People get that. People absolutely get that, but it's not something we talk about. We just talk about in terms of numbers, you know, 10 years, 15 years. Yeah. So I think, I think, even though we think we've talked about it, we haven't really. People who who haven't in their lives experienced that, it, it's it needs to be something that's just part of our conversation, and it's going to be person by person and stories by stories, and people like Patrick and Sharice talk, and we'll get there. Please, yeah, I'll just be brief too. I think that. You know, what's happening is, as a part of the national conversation, many people are uninformed about what restorative justice is. And I think that invariably poses a challenge, right, with people being receptive to it. And I'm no expert in restorative justice necessarily, although I did work at common justice for almost two years with Danielle and have facilitated restorative justice circles. So I know the effectiveness of it. But I think because people are bereft of knowledge around what it is, it poses challenges relative to people accepting restorative justice as an alternative. Yeah, I think we have two mics that work, which is great. It's been around to be here. So I um thanks for that, Andre. And we can we can certainly talk more about that when we talk about reentry. But I, I Lee, I wanted to kind of turn to you because of the research that you've been doing in New York and looking at at mandatory minimums. And you know, we heard uh, from, from the chief judge on the last panel about the kind of racial disparities that you tend to see in the system. So I want you to talk about kind of your research. It's very, very compelling. Thank you, Chris. This is making its way over. I'm not great at multitasking, so I apologize in advance for anything that goes terribly wrong about this. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much to John Jay and also the Center for Community Alternatives for this event. I'm you know, very happy to be here and to share the research that we've been doing. I am going to throw a lot of numbers at people, so I will jump right in here. Uh, DCJS examined, let me move forward here. DCJS examined uh, lower court felony arraignments in 2019 and created our own proxy for arraignments who looked like they were facing mandatory prison. Uh, we based this on the, the charge at arraignment, on the conviction history, and on incarceration data that we have available at DCJS. The cases that we flagged as looking as though they were facing a mandatory prison charge are listed on this slide, and we also can make our slides available. 
This, I think, speaks directly to what the chief judge was mentioning, was that the black defendants that we are seeing in our data were much more likely to be facing mandatory prison charges at lower court arraignment than were the Hispanic or the white defendants, and we're just mentioning that as well. A couple of things, though, that we do want to note here. Number one, the disproportionality across race and ethnicity in the data. We're seeing here in New York City 17,000 Black defendants who were arrested and arraigned on mandatory prison charges in 2019, compared to 11,000 Hispanic defendants and 3,000 white defendants. So the disproportionality across the system is, is pretty apparent in the data. We see that in uh, outside New York City as well, where the percentage of cases that are facing mandatory prison are lower overall, but there are still these differences in disproportionality with 19,000 black defendants, 7,000 Hispanic, and 23,000 white defendants. We do also see that the proportion of black and Hispanic defendants who are facing mandatory charges is higher in both New York City and outside New York City compared to white defendants. Here we took a little bit closer look to see what was causing that uh, flipping somebody into a mandatory prison charge in New York City. We see that it's largely due to the uh, current charge at 20%. It's the current charge that's making somebody eligible for mandatory minimum sentence. Outside New York City, it is mostly due to prior felony convictions. When we look a little bit closer at just those arraignments that are facing mandatory prison, we see that in New York City, about 14% of defendants who are facing prison ended up being convicted of mandatory prison charges. The differences across race and ethnicity were small, 14% for Black and Hispanic defendants, 15% for white and other defendants. However, we do see that the Black defendants were more likely to have their cases resolved in a non-conviction, meaning the cases were dismissed or a small percentage of them were still pending. In the rest of the state, we see about 22% of defendants facing mandatory prison charges at arraignment actually being convicted of mandatory prison charges. And in, as in New York City, Black defendants were somewhat more likely to have their cases dismissed than white or Hispanic defendants, um, but in general, those differences were small in the percentage being convicted of mandatory prison charges. When we look at the cases where prison is required, the differences in the percentage of people actually being sentenced to prison also are small. 85% of the Black defendants, 88% of Hispanic, and 88% of white defendants were sentenced to prison among those cases where prison was required. Outside New York City, the differences are a little bit bigger with 79% of black defendants being sentenced to prison when prison is required compared to 70% of Hispanic and white defendants. When prison is not required, relatively few people are actually being sentenced to prison. But here that we see that there are some differences across race and ethnicity, with 12% of Hispanic defendants in New York City being sentenced to prison when prison is not required, 9% of Black defendants, and 5% of white defendants. Outside New York City, again, the numbers are small, but the percentages are a little bit different, with 14% of Hispanic, 11% of Black, and 5% uh, of white defendants being sentenced to prison. So when we sort of summarize all of this, we're seeing that in New York City, defendants are more likely to be facing mandatory prison at arraignment compared to outside New York City. Black and Hispanic defendants are more likely to be facing mandatory prison compared to white defendants. There are small differences in convictions to mandatory prison charges. Uh, and there are bigger differences in sentences to prison among the mandatory prison charges in non-New York City only. The next thing we took a look at was prison sentence lengths. And here, uh, again, we examined the 2019 lower court arraignments, and we looked at the distributions of what people were actually being sentenced to. We saw that the most common single sentence was often the minimum allowable sentence, uh, so, for example, when we looked at Class B, uh, B and C violent felonies without a prior felony conviction, 
the sentence that is eligible is five to 25 years, and the most common sentence imposed was five years. Uh, 56 out of 197 sentences to prison were for five years. The next most common was uh, six years at 20 people being sentenced. We did see that prison sentences tended to be longer outside New York City, and there were also more often instances where people were as likely to receive the shortest allowable sentence as a longer sentence. So, for example, five years was also the most common sentence outside New York City. 21 people were sentenced to five years. However, 20 people were sentenced to 10 years. So there are big differences in the sentencing in New York City and outside. So our analysis, though, focused on what percentage of people were getting the shortest allowable sentence. Uh, here we see that there are very few white defendants in New York City. There were 25, 18, or 93 total sentences to prison among white defendants, depending on the charge. Um, and so the part of the problem, part of the uh, challenge, is that there are often too few defense, defendants in one category to make strong conclusions or to draw, draw strong conclusions. Uh, second, we see that cases outside New York City were less likely to receive the shortest sentence. And we see that outside New York City, the Black defendants convicted of VFOs were more likely to receive the shortest sentence compared to white defendants. When we look at prison sentences when prison is not required, uh, we see that, that prison lengths for the, the drug offenders tend to be much longer. Very, very few drug offenders are getting the shortest allowable sentence. Um, when we are looking at, on the wrong page because I can't multitask here. Uh, we also see that um, outside New York City only, there are some differences in the sentence lengths between Black and white defendants, but there's no stable pattern. So in some cases, Black defendants will see, receive a shorter sentence or more likely to receive the shortest sentence. And in other cases, the white defendants would be more likely to receive a shorter sentence. So pulling all of this together, we see that in general, people are more likely to receive the shortest allowable sentence than something longer. The two main exceptions were first time VFOs and also drug, drug offenses, which tended to be longer. Overall, the rest of state defendants received longer prison sentences than in New York City. Um, in New York City, there were very small differences between Black and Hispanic defendants. And outside New York City, there were bigger, bigger differences, but no strong pattern. And again, in many cases, there were too few defendants to make strong conclusions. Thanks so much, Lee. And it's, it's always like stunning to me to think that depending on where you live, depending on your race, you can have a different experience in the in the criminal legal system, and you can face more time depending on you know on those factors. And you know, Andrea, I wanted I wanted to turn to you because much of the conversation today has been about what is happening up at the front end and changing mandatory minimums. Second, look for folks who are on the inside. That's all very uh, important and exciting but we have people who are coming home and we will continue to have people, unfortunately, who, are going to, who will be coming home because we're feeding so many people into the system. So hopefully these reforms will reduce the number of people on the inside, but we still got people, brothers and sisters, neighbors, fathers, mothers, um, who are coming out of prison. What, 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 do, what do they need to succeed when, when they are leaving, coming out of prison? Yeah, thank you for that question, Chris. I think I'll start off by saying this. You know, we think about reentry, you know, people oftentimes think about when people are coming out. But those of us who are incarcerated, and I served 16 years of my life in prison, we know that reentry starts when you're inside. It doesn't start when people are out. And as it relates to the second look act, I would maintain that there has to be a second look in our communities, because the very communities from which we're coming from are disempowered, highly impoverished, low literacy rates is a recipe for people to be fed into a system of mass incarceration. And so I would maintain that people need a lot of things, a litany of things when they're coming out of prison or jail, 
And the communities that they're going back to are under-resourced, and it simply perpetuates the cycle of recidivism. And I'll say this last point, that when you think about this within the context of a public health lens, my mentor, Eddie Ellis, one of the things he talked to me about is this tuberculosis kind of model. And what this model essentially is, is like you have a place that's infected, right? A place where there's an infection that's happening. You pull people who are infected in that area out of it, and you put them somewhere, and you contain them. And you're supposed to treat them. And what happens is when people are pulled out of a community that's infected like that, put in prisons or jails, supposedly treated, rehabilitated, et cetera, then return back to the infected area, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to be reinfected, they'll go back again. So there has to be resources put into the community so when people come out, they can have access to the things they need. So employment is critically important. Chris, you know that all too well, the work you do at CEO. That's just a super justice and opportunity here, John Jay. We offer people opportunities to access higher education who are in prison, at Oldsville prison in particular, and when they come out, we connect them to those resources. So education is important. But something simple, and my colleague Judy said this to me, Judy Clark over here, is getting an ID card. Right, being able to access getting birth certificates. Now, I meet with docs commissioners, and they are working to put some of those things in place, but we've come to a point where those things are urgent and now. And we can't wait until next year or two years from now to put things in place for people to access the resources they need. So employment, education, getting access to the documentation that people need, and being connected to groups of people who can serve as support systems for folk when they come out so that they ultimately become co-producers of public safety, right? Rather than people fearing them to go take public safety. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. One thing I'll also yes. You know, something something I'll plug too that we've been working on with many others, including CCA, is kind of enhanced gate money. You know, this idea that people come out of incarceration are given $40 uh, to survive, you know, we want to see that amount be much higher um, to give people real resources so that they can make decisions and choices for themselves and their family as they come home. I heard someone say, you know, I get a Metro card only when I go to and from the place. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not agency. You know, agency is when I, I have enough money to go where I want to go to do the things that I need to do, not just what someone tells me uh, to do. So we, you know, we see enhanced gate money, but we also know that housing, um, you know, access to employment and, and, and careers, you know, real jobs uh, are also critical. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to questions. I'm trying to be really good on the, on the time. Um, before we do, I just want to say, I, I went back and looked at news articles in the early 70s. And this was a time where the state, there were probably conferences like this where people were talking about tough on crime. Um, and in 1973, you know, few, several years after the Attica uprising, um, there was a New York Times article by Paul Montgomery talking about the conditions in prison. And he interviewed uh, Mr. Battle. Mr. Battle said, and he's, he's, he's on the inside. I can see no future. No inmate in this institution has a future. There's no rehabilitation to be had. There's nothing to look forward to when you get out, except going back to dealing drugs or knocking some dude over the head who's worked all week for his bread. And it's reminded me about the timeless kind of wisdom of people who are directly impacted, constantly telling us when we are going down the wrong path. And, and, and we, folks in power, are not listening to that. That wisdom that he has was true. And there's been a lot of suffering since then because of the way that we passed Rockefeller drug laws at the time, all of that. We are now trying to undo those systems. And it's such important work. And I want to really give credit to my, my friends here, but also credit to the brothers and sisters who have come out. And I think someone said earlier, like, have the courage to say, you know, I'm going to change. 
I'm not going back to that lifestyle. It's real hard because we haven't done enough uh, to help. So I think this work is important. I'm really honored to be part of, of this uh, panel. So I will move questions. I think I'm, I think I'm doing good. We got five minutes and let me tell you, I, I grew up in Best Style. I know what the question is. <laughs> You know, that other thing, you know, you that other thing after yeah. questions. Okay. Um, I'll try to be brief, which will be hard. This was a great day. Um, after everything, you know, after this wonderful day, you know, I'm still, I'm still confused. The, um, you know, the chief judge was saying, hand things back to judges is a mixed bag. And I hear about mandatory minimums, which my impression seems to live in the legislature. That's where this lives. And I recently read a wonderful book, Charged by Emily Bazelon, which talks about the tremendous power that prosecutors have and the potential for prosecutorial misconduct, which seems to relate directly back to mandatory minimums, because who's going to make the call whether a charge is subject to a mandatory minimum with prosecutors. So I'm still trying to figure out, you know, where does this live? Where does the solution live? Does the solution live with the legislator? You know, legislature um, is, is that, you know, where the focus is? Does it live with how we relate to prosecutors? And where do they come from? I mean, DAs are elected. So I don't know. Can someone enlighten me? That's a, that's a great question. I'll have Mark. Uh, great question. Answers all of it. Uh, and, and, you know, but it's all really part of the process of political power. So, like, as you say, DAs are elected. So you try to elect DAs who will charge, who will say, I'm not going to charge a mandatory minimum just because it's there. But you, but you have to change the laws. In the, in the end, the, yes, the legislature sets what the laws are. They set the they set the what you know who's going who who has a president. What charges require require a president and how long? And that's the campaign. I know that that community is not cages and others are involved in is to is to is to bring that political power to the legislature to do that. And then the judges then you know whatever's in front of them. In terms of the range of sentences, then they then they act within that. I think the reason we've been talking about mandatory minimums is that we're trying to start somewhere. And that idea that when you have a, a, a legislature that's been extremely reluctant to even touch the stuff at the ten foot pole, you want to bring the you want to sort of go back to the why do you have to send someone to prison? Maybe it would be, be the right thing in this particular case, but in every case. Um, and then you're you're sort of starting to question just that 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 requirement of it, and then you can take it from there to like lower maximums and and do all these other things that that need to happen. But but yeah, it's the legislature and it's basically voters. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Melanie Ayala, and I work for a credible messenger organization that just got a part of New York. So it's a kind of piggyback off of like well, the topic that was touched about like resources and stuff. Um, I'm actually trying to uh, curate a resource fair uh, specifically towards uh, in previously incarcerated individuals that uh, just need resources to enter society. So I guess my question would be, uh, since we're such a new organization, do you have a organization that you would recommend that I start with to try to start building the resources for this resource here? I, I mean, the first thing I said, New York City has a great ATI reentry coalition. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to kind of put you in touch with them. Yes. And that way, that information can go out to the okay. member organizations. Okay, so, perfect. Yeah, Thank yeah, you so much. Absolutely. absolutely. All right, we're going we're gonna to take one, one more question. I, I know this is a book. I, I feel bad. Not that but bad. But I'm, I'm getting the hook. I just feel terrible. Uh, you should have a book. Well, no, please, please go. Please go. Please go. Right. And a question. Not a statement. All right. Um, Today is the 15th and 15 month anniversary from our release. All right. Congratulations. I took my freedom, and I want to echo something that 
the gentleman at the end said, um, in regards to rehabilitation and change and resources, it begins in prison. And so um, knowing what I went through with docs to take my freedom, right? Knowing that I got absolutely no assistance at the 12 o'clock hour, they actually tried to blackball me and do everything possible for me not to make it out, right? Uh, is, can there be something put into place to hold docs responsible because they're supposed to be doing work while you're in there to assist you prior to you, you know, being released? There have. If I speak about what they literally did to me, with me, people are going to be like, what? All right? So there has to be something. Docs is getting away with being negligent on their part in regards to the preparation prior to actual release. Yeah. Thank you. That brother Good staying in that question, glad you're home. And, yeah. and hoping, you know, just sending you love and light, man, to con you know, continue oh, your man, I'm, journey. I'm doing great things. Man. Good. Trust good, good. Right. 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 And I'll be brief for the sake of time. You know, those of us who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, we go inside, I think someone referenced about, like, putting themselves in, like, a million different pieces and putting themselves back together. And one of the things that we also do is, right, we commit ourselves when we release to localize ourselves in spaces that have impact and to influence the discussion and to inform the discussion. And so in response to this gentleman's question, right, you know, we're meeting now with the commissioner of docs, the commissioner of parole, et cetera. We just here at John Jay on Tuesday, we met with them. And we're starting to be in these spaces to begin to inform the conversation, which is critically important. I will say there is some openness on behalf of docs, right? To begin to start examining the recommendations that are offered by many of us that come from some of you in this room and thinking about innovative ways to engage people while they're incarcerated. So I will say that there is some dialogue that's happening there. We know that the system in docs has been established in a way that hasn't been as supportive for people that are incarcerated. But we are committed to making sure that they understand the needs of the people that are there. I know folks from Canny are here that are doing investigative work in the prisons to ensure people are protected and treated fairly and equitably and living in safe conditions. So I'll say that we're committed to making sure that we uplift and lift up those things that you share, you share with us. And we're committed to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I, I'm, I'm getting the, the hook. We are at time. Please, please thank the panel. Um, sorry, did not get to all the questions online and here. Yeah. And I have the to close us out a person that hopefully many of you know and will come to know if not. Mm -hmm. We are going to hear from the Honorable Assembly Member of the True School. Sir. Who is the sponsor of the second look at? And before I hand the mic over to her to close this out, um, uh, a quick pitch for anybody who was moved today in the discussions about the second look act, the Earn Time Act, the Eliminate Mandatory Minimums Act, and wants to get involved in that advocacy. We'll be sending a follow up email to everybody who came, including with an opportunity to come with us to Albany on May 13th. We're going to have an advocacy day honoring formerly and currently incarcerated moms and moms of incarcerated children and speaking to legislators about those bills. Um, there's also going to be an all women band and some other fun things that are happening. So that's the day after Mother's Day and we'll send an email and hope to see many of you there. Um, and now I will hand it over to Assemblymember Latrice Foster. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. You know, I am from South Carolina, but I cut my teeth in politics with the Honorable Una Clark. Mm -hmm. And she always tells me that she's local, but she's no Jamaican in the house. Mm -hmm. What's the rest of it? 
Right. Tyler Y. <laughs> and which I've come to learn, meaning that she's small in stature, but she's so huge and she's so large and she's so impactful and she shakes the ground as she walks on that she shakes the politics and politics of albany and that of course is not other than katie right she's so powerful that she moves me out of my i don't even have an office in Albany. it's her office that i just come in and visit every now and then and it's because i realize that the movement is so important um that it needs a home it needs a place and it needs to be supported and so i do encourage you uh to go up to albany with her and there are also some things i'll i'll start off by saying that there's an opportunity um, to to inject yourselves into the appointment of the commissioner of docs. Because the commissioner is only acting. Mm -hmm. He's acting. Yeah. There's a lot of people acting. Yeah. And we know that there is no place for actresses and actors. <laughs> In that role, we did hear that when most people go to the doc, docs, mm -hmm. they're looking for healing, they're looking for a cure, they're looking for rehabilitation. And we don't want a doctor who's acting. No, no. And so there is a sister who I'm going to plug. Her name is Banda Bond. Seaworth. Banda yeah. yeah. is, and, yeah. and you know her, so... That's already, you know, an opportunity for, for her to have a credible messenger who is lifting her up. And so I did want to just state that there is an opportunity for you to reach out to the governor's office in this moment in order to say who you'd like to see at the helm of this organization. The other thing is we've done something very, very amazing um, within the past couple of years. And that is allowing people who are on parole the opportunity to register to oh, and to also go and exercise your right to vote. Vote is V-O-T-E. For me, V, victory, O, over, T, the, E, enemy. So if you are not registered to vote, and if you do not vote, you're not utilizing your currency. It doesn't matter to me how big, how bad. I'm from Brownsville. <laughs> I know people who have done and enrolled with the best of them and the worst of them. But if you do not go out and register to vote, Guess what? All of the work that we're talking about here means absolutely nothing to the people in politics who is responsible for changing the circumstances that we are all involved in. When I ran for office, I represent all, almost 300,000 people in my beautiful, beautiful Brownsville community. Only 5,000 people come out to vote. Mm -hmm. And that are the, those are the dynamics that I think that we can do in order to begin to shift the tide in all of the legislation that we've heard today because people are only as good as their most recent election. Even today, we heard from based on a lot of the protests that are happening, we're watching the criminalization of protest. Yeah. But... If people hadn't protested Jim Crow, which was the law of the land, and made some people uneasy, and made some people uncomfortable, and broke the law by sitting at the table, we would not be in these circumstances today. And so the idea and the art of criminalization, of course, moves us into this perpetual movement 
of institutionalized slavery, which they do not want us ever to overcome. And so it makes me very honored in order to, number one, work with the Data Collaborative at, here at John Jay, but of course, Center for Community Alternatives, who also has uh, an office in my district. Um, and so they're doing amazing work with young people. I see the sisters who wanted to speak regarding young people and doing some of that great work over there. So I want to plug you. And, um, and thank you all so much for everything that you do. And of course, all the formerly incarcerated people who are here, as well as your loved ones who come up to Albany each and every day. We know that from the census in 2020, the rate of incarceration in Brownsville is 722 people per 100,000. It's one of the highest in the state of New York. 30,000 people or so, but nearly 75% of them are black and brown who are locked away in a prison today. And we heard the some of the dynamics and the statistics from the Department of Criminal Justice Services. Thank you. We know many of them are serving disproportionately like these sentences. And we know that um, there's something that we need to do about it because more policing does not make us safer. As a state lawmaker, we are all duty bound to look for legislative or budgetary solutions to the problems and the real life challenges that we face. One of the things, of course, we are fighting for is the repeal of mandatory minimums, which originated with the Rockefeller drug laws, which we basically began to, to bring down that wall of injustice that has been keeping us upstate with the football numbers. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded even when I hear mandatory minimums that there was a young man in my district who probably was, a, was nearly 21, maybe 18 years old, and he received a 99 year sentence. 99 years, and he has not even lived any of his adult life, yeah. which it will all be spent. And so if this is what fuels me and each of you to be powerful criminal justice warriors. Um, and I'm honored that the bill has been named the Marvin Mayfield. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On in each of us and everything that we do. Of course, it allows judges to assess a case and render a sentences as based on unique circumstances rather than looking at people based on a number and a uh, equation, which are generally inherently discriminatory in nature. And of course, leads to a number of coerced pleas. And 98% of those cases um, often end in guilty pleas because people will say, well, look, I got to. Do, I might have to do 15 years. If I get, you know, take this plea, I'll do five years. I come home, I'll be out on parole in three, right? And this is the, this is the, this is like tabletop math that happens in my community all the time. This is how we, this is how we play the dozens. And it's unfair and it's unjust. There is no justice about it, but we are going to do everything that we can to see something about it. And of course, we want to take away the power of prosecutors to utilize mandatory minimums in order to make us have to make those racist decisions each and every day. Of course, I'm the co-sponsor of the Second Look Act, um, and we're working very hard in order for us to demonstrate that it's important for people to have just an opportunity at a hearing. It's not a get out of jail free card. Though my daughter seems to think that I give those out all the time. <laughs> She does. She even made me little. <laughs> and, but it's not that. It just gives you another opportunity to go before a judge to allow them to have the discretion that they look for all the time to be able to make the determinations as to whether or not someone should be able to come home. It just gives you another bite at the apple to apply for resentencing after having served already 10 years or half of your sentence. And so uh, we want to, you know, also lift up the On Time Act, which I am a co-sponsor of. And this bill would strengthen and expand good time and maritime laws to encourage personal transformation in prison. Um, I did lastly want to leave by saying that I have been working with the Osborne Association uh, in order to provide re-entry housing. Right now, we are building 68 units of reentry housing, which is specifically for people who have been incarcerated and their families. 
and their families. Yes. Right. It is yes. impossible for me to stand up and say, keep families together. And we're talking about the border. But each and every time I have to look that they're building housing, mm -hmm. it's always the halfway house situation mm -hmm. or these studio apartments or one yeah, room shacks right. that people cannot be reunited yeah. with their families. Yeah. Yeah. Or we have a group called Gamma. Get, uh, grandmothers are mothers again. Give Gamma back her life. Yeah. And again, it is a great opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure to be able to close you out. And thank you so much for this opportunity. I am Assembly Member of Truth Walk. Drop the mic. Right, exactly. If the Sunday member already dropped the mic. Well, th there's nothing more to be said. I'm really grateful to, for all of you who participated, shared your thoughts, took the time to prep, and um, gave you of your gave us of your time. And thank you all for um, joining us here today uh, at John Jay. And for those of us, those of you who joined us virtually, we're really grateful for the time you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you. Moderating. Uh, 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 uh,